I think the U.S. Navy has an operational 150 kilowatt laws. And that's what they were doing. The one aboard the USS Ponce, the law system, is only 30 kilowatts. And it was able to explode an outboard engine on an incoming Iranian ship. It was able to knock out a, a drone in flight by burning off one of the wings. A 150 kilowatt one would definitely be able to take down an ICBM with no problem. You know, it would just be an issue of probably the targeting system, the, the optics aboard it to be able to put the laser where it needs to be. The power shouldn't be an issue. And just this year, actually very shortly after this happened with the FITS, they test fired a laser across Chesapeake Bay. The Navy did 13 miles. And it was just a low power green laser, but they could have been testing the targeting systems or the optics. And there is stuff all over about this, and it's all recent too. July 18th, June 27th. And this is what they've been developing. This is Star Wars. This is what Reagan wanted to put on satellites, and now we're just being able to put it on high flying aircraft eventually. That's what DARPA wants to do. And now have it on Navy ships. And this would be a game changer, folks. It would absolutely, the Chinese and the Russians would flip if this became widely known. Because they threw a fit about, about FAD being put into South Korea. And that's just interceptors. This is orders of magnitude more effective. You can shoot one of these things over and over and over. You don't need a whole bunch of different ammunition, a whole bunch of money invested in one of these systems. And I'm telling you, the more I look at this, they absolute. I mean, the launcher is here. Here's where the Fitz was, and here's Hawaii. And if they have that upgraded laser where they can hit something, you know, a few hundred miles up, I mean, it, this would be perfect because they, can, they don't have to be over here off the coast of North Korea. They can be here in friendly waters. And especially if they were going to target Tokyo or someplace in this region. You know, they could shoot the thing down from here and nobody could say a word because they're in, you know, they're not in international waters. You wouldn't, well, probably wouldn't have to worry about Chinese warships or Russian warships coming this close to Japan, but that might be why the Chinese and the Russians had to cook up this scheme. Because it was a Chinese ship that hit the fits. And they would have had to know where it was and know what it was doing. And you can read about this too, the Helad system that DARPA's been developing. They want to put it a laser like this, but they want to put it on it, an aircraft. And I think this is just part of the testing phase, part of the, the you know, process that's going on to get one of these lasers with the ability to shoot down a missile aboard a high-flying aircraft. I mean, we have drones that can circle the, the globe pretty much, you know, independently of pilots and continually be aloft. And that would be, you wouldn't need satellites if we could do this. To have these drones up there equipped with these lasers and they could take down they could take down even the Russian ICBMs I'm telling you they uh, I was reading this article here where they're talking about this laser I'm sorry I had the wrong picture up but it was a it was just an artist rendering anyway yesterday and but this one this 150 kilowatt laser would be three to ten times more power, powerful than the one they've used to uh, melt targets out of the air and this has to be what they're doing. This absolutely has to be what they're doing. And the Chinese have some plan, I guess, to try to defeat this with smoke, but I don't know how you get smoke up at, you know, the levels, the altitude that they would need to defeat these lasers. They could probably defeat it battlefield ground targets, but if this if we were actually be able to deploy a system that was sea based and air based, it would be absolutely a game changer it would give the US a huge advantage
And that might not actually be a good thing. That might actually force some people's hands. If they know that we're developing this, they might try to hit us before we can finish it. Because that's the reason the North Koreans want it. I mean, the, once the North Koreans can establish that they have the ability to hit anywhere in the world with an ICBM, they join a really, really exclusive club. Is it us, the British, the French, the Russians, the Chinese, the Indians, and the Pakistanis, I think? I might have missed one there, but... Yeah, they definitely don't want to set off a nuclear arms race in East Asia, especially with the, the groups that are now infiltrating the Philippines. But I think that might be... And, you know, the, I actually read another article. The Hawaiians are actually doing drills now to, to deal with what would happen if one of these missiles would be on the way. They're saying they would get about 12 minutes, 12 to 20 minutes lead time. And there was an article about that. I wish I would have pulled it up on a tab. But this is it, folks. This is really, honest to God, you know, based on your input and what I've been seeing, this has to be DARPA, a DARPA issue. This has to be this, uh, this new Navy laser that the Navy didn't want anybody to know about. That's why they had to cook up this story, you know, about the, the hole below the water line. And they had to keep this out of the public because if it was widely known, boy, I tell you what, it would change things like you wouldn't believe. So, I mean, we can put it out here on YouTube as a theory, and that's what it is. We're speculating it's a theory. But, you know, based on available evidence and what we've seen, I don't know how you can come to any other conclusion. And that, uh, that as far as that cargo ship goes, I think we've proven conclusively that even if this, even if the Fitz was sitting there at anchor, based on what the captain said and the level of lead time he had to avoid the ship, he could have avoided the ship. You know, he says he saw it 10 minutes ahead of time. 10 minutes would have been plenty for a small ship like that. You know, and if this thing has a, a giant power system below the waterline there, they could they definitely did not want anybody to see evidence of that. And that's why they had to do that three and a half week underwater welding expedition. The idea of just moving it from one side of the port to the other, that that would have been necessary is just silly. So... Anyway, we're going to keep an eye on this, folks. I think this is the direction we're going to go. Um, I know Fox News put out something about the soldiers, should have, the sailors, excuse me, should have spoken up, you know, and they didn't. And that's going to be the Navy line on this. You know, they're going to, uh, you know, if this was really the case, and this is, had been what their investigation had led to, they wouldn't have just medically relieved the commander. They would have done what they did to Ariola back with the porter. You know, they would have left him, you know, out to dry like they did that guy. You know, and based on what we saw with that guy, and or heard, I should say, from the bridge audio, I think, you know, the guy goofed. The guy made a mistake. And, you know, when you're the commander of a ship, you know, you've got to be responsible for your crew. But I think at this point now that we're almost, what, 30, 40 days, something uh, ridiculous beyond the event, and we haven't seen anybody say one word about charges or one word about... Um, prosecuting anyone, not from the Navy, there's been speculation, you know, on CNN and stuff, but that something else definitely was going on, that, you know, they got blindsided by something, and they were doing something they weren't supposed to do at the time. I wouldn't be surprised if the Navy absolutely was in live communication with the Fitz this entire time, and that's why they, uh, they stuck with that 220 that 220 time because they they knew you know they didn't need the uh but they needed to have the perception be in the public that this was an accident and so they had to come out and say that yes the the japanese maritime self-defense forces were first on the scene i think they were there from the beginning that's why they were first on the scene because they have as much of an interest in this as anyone else does they've you know the north koreans have threatened tokyo and I'm sure they would love to have this system aboard their ships. And, you know, Tokyo being, you know, roughly here and North Korea here, that wouldn't, you would need a laser. Because I don't think that, even from South Korea, would have time. You know, that would be a, a fairly low trajectory shot. And with what they've been able to dis display their ability to do, you know, after the, the Fitz... I just don't think it's any kind of a coincidence. The Fitzgerald gets disabled and taken out of the region, and all of a sudden North Korea 
fires a missile 1,500 miles up and 1,000 miles out to sea on July 4th. So, anyway, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Um, we got a lot more research to do on this laser issue, and there's folks down here that I know know a whole lot more about DARPA and the uh, issues going on with that particular governmental agency and what they've been developing in the last few years. But like, share, subscribe. Really appreciate it. Share it with your friends. And if you want notifications, I guess there's a little bell you can click. Um, you can do that too. So we will see you next time. Thank you.